get my shoes and out the door. I'm alive, six, seven, eight, BYWG Tribe, this is Dr. Noah. The supplement of the month for September is our very own Joint Formula Plus, with the 10% discount code for the month of September being Joint for Sept. So it's capital J, lowercase o i n t, the number four, capital S, lowercase e p t. The product of the month for September is our favorite blue light blocking lenses, Swannies. The book of the month for September is The Emotion Code by Dr. Bradley Nelson. At the end of the upcoming podcast, I will go into a little more detail of why we chose these three for the month of September. So stay tuned till the end for a few minute description of each. Keep in mind all the links, discount codes, and special offers for the product, supplement, and book will be listed in the show notes and iTunes, posted on social media, in our weekly newsletter, and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, and I am your co-host. Today, our guest is Dr. Rupi Audula. Did I get that right? You did, yeah, very well. <laughs> very well. <laughs> he is a multiple-time author, first to Doctor's Kitchen, and his most recent book release, Eat to Beat illness. Well, actually not released. It's released next Tuesday. I was fortunate to get an advanced copy of this book months ago, and I loved it. I am a foodie for sure. I collect cookbooks. <laughs> so needless to say, I was excited <laughs> to get it. So how are you today, Doc? I'm good. I'm very well, thank you. And thanks for those kind words. No, my pleasure. Let, no. Me, let me read your bio, and then we'll get started. Dr. Audula is a emergency room medical doctor, general physician, and best-selling author. He is a firm believer in the power of food and lifestyle change to heal and prevent illness and wants to make healthy lifestyle enjoyable and deliciously accessible to everyone. He is the founder of the Culinary Med- Medicine Nonprofit in UK and is the author of The Doctor's Kitchen and soon to be released Eat to Beat Illness. He lives in London, England. Uh, as you can see, he's definitely England, and I'm right outside of New York City. You can tell by our accents. <laughs> and you can find more information at thedoctorskitchen.com. So first question, as always, is how about just giving our audience a little bit more about who you are and how you became a doc and an author? Sure, man. So I have been in medicine now for over 10 years. I um, initially, in my in my first year of medicine, when I was doing acute med, I got ill, uh, as is um, a common story with a lot of people who have gone into the lifestyle medicine world. I started suffering from something called atrial fibrillation, which is a kind of condition where your heart beats irregularly, and in my case, very fast. And uh, I was going to have an ablation, and I was on a whole bunch of different meds and stuff. And then it was my family that really said, you know, you should really start looking at your lifestyle and trying to improve your diet and, and see if that helps. And really, to appease them, I decided to give it a shot. I did a lot more research. Um, as many people will know, we're not taught nutrition at medical school. So I started doing a deep dive into um, the, the clinical journals and stuff. And I found this plethora of information about how we can utilize diets to balance inflammation, improve our, our weight control, improve our mood, etc. cetera. Um, and that kind of just set me on my journey. And I was able to overcome my condition um, within about 12 months and and thereafter I just started having more open honest conversations with my patients about how they can eat their way to health and I started doing videos and I'm a massive foodie like yourself so I wanted to to make it delicious and accessible and I wanted to talk to people about the clinical research behind the ingredients I used uh, with with food and um, and yeah and, and here we are two books later I never expected to have a book deal, let alone two and the first one in the U.S. now. So I'm super excited about how we can actually change the medical model, and, and, and that's um, what we're trying to do with culinary medicine in the U.K. Yeah, yeah that was a perfect, you know, segue into my second question. You know, you know this book, because I've had it for a while now, stresses that a person's diet is really linked to their overall health, including their mental health as well. And, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit um, what led you to incorporate, you know, patients' nutrition and behavior into their care? And it was, uh, it was uh, something that happened to you, your health kind of, uh, which is not uncommon for someone who's going through residency and all those kind of things. I mean, that's a very, very, uh, a very, very stressful time. Um, but is there anything else? That, uh, how, 
that incorporation. Talk a little bit more about that incorporation. Yeah, so I mean, I uh, I had to go back to basics with my nutrition knowledge. I didn't have any sort of formal training in this, and so it really started with looking at myself and looking at what things could I simply do to improve my overall well-being. And it started with getting rid of cereals in the morning and then not being reliant on hospital canteen sandwiches. Um, trying to improve my uh, my mental health by practicing meditation, something I was taught how to do as a teenager. Both my parents from Indian origin, but I'd fallen out of favor since I was at medical school because of the because of the extra you know added stresses and the the things I had to do on my to do list. Um, and then sleep hygiene and and different sorts of exercise and you know this sort of combination of all these different lifestyle factors of which food is a very important part was ultimately why I was able to put my body in the best environment as possible. Um, and that sounds a little bit out there, but actually we have these innate mechanisms that allow ourselves to be put into what we call homeostasis, which is essentially a posh word for balance. And maintaining that equilibrium is something that I was able to do um, well with, with food. Um, and I just started talking a, a lot more about this, and I started instigating uh, a lot more dietary regimes for, for people with arthritis, people with weight issues, people with type 2 diabetes. And patients started loving the focus on nutritional medicine. Um, it's, it's currently what I'm doing my master's in at the moment at University of Surrey in, in England. Um, and it's a fascinating subject that's getting a lot more attention and a lot more evidence base behind it. Um, you were mentioning mood and, and stuff. You know, there have only been a few uh, clinical trials looking at uh, food as an intervention for people with moderate to severe depression. Small scale studies, but super, super impressive. And when you look at the mechanistic evidence behind how we can improve inflammation, improve uh, the quality of fats, um, the uh, different sorts of proteins we have, improving our gut health by in, uh, increasing uh, the number of different types of fibers and variety of foods, we have some pretty impressive effects, you know. So when, when people say food is medicine, I'm a firm believer in that. It's, it's a fantastic adjunct to all the other medications that we have at our disposal as clinicians. Was it, was it an uncomfortable start for you when you started discussing nutrition with your with your clients, I mean, it's for, for chiropractors are a little bit different. We're taught quite a bit of nutrition. We're kind of used to talking about that. Was it uncomfortable for you in the beginning, or or did, did, was it pretty natural once you had your own healing experience? I think I think it's the latter. That quote, the, the the latter point there is is pivotal for me because I had experienced what it was like to be a patient. I understood. The frustration of it. I was able to empathize. I was uh, able to understand the vulnerability um, and the constant questioning. And, and for that, it was quite an easy segue for me to uh, at least put people in pointers. And I'm very honest about um, my knowledge in areas and lack of knowledge in other areas. Um, and, and so, you know, again, having that humility with patients, a lot of people, um, definitely responded to and it certainly resonated well with them um, and that's why you know I, I feel like I've been able to gradually build my knowledge base to the point where I was able to launch the doctor's kitchen in the first place because people think I did this sort of overnight in reality I only launched the social uh, media channels and the platforms about four years ago but my learning has started way way before that and I never had the confidence to even start talking about food as medicine, which is traditionally a cavalier subject, um, until, you know, years after I'd been reading and attending a lot of the, the um, conferences around the world on nutrition and medicine. Right, right. Great. I love that answer. So, you know, as I mentioned, I, I love the layout of this book. I love the colorful <laughs> pictures, the well-taken pictures, you know, especially nice. being a chiropractor. Uh, you essentially start the book uh, talking about eating for the brain, which is the, you know, the runs the entire show. It's the, the head honcho of the central nervous system and heart health. So why did you decide to start there? Well, I just thought there's no more fascinating place to start with than the brain. And I think our brains are... Uh, 
a kind of like the forgotten organ until things start to go wrong and people experience different symptoms, brain fog, um, fatigue, uh, loss of concentration, um, all these vague symptoms. And then ultimately, you know, I, I'm not too sure exactly what the stats are in the US, but in the UK, the biggest killer is um, Alzheimer's. And the number of people suffering with Alzheimer's cannot be explained by an aging population alone. Our, our brains are, are fundamentally under attack, and it's a catalog of errors that we have introduced, and, and a lot of that it comes down to the food. We have excess sugar. We have excess inflammation. We do not stimulate ourselves appropriately. We lack sleep. We lack exercise. We lack um, uh, a connection with nature, and all these things together um, attack uh, our, um, our, our nervous system. And that, this is why I really wanted to start with the book, because... I think um, people only really start to think about looking after the brains into later life, whereas actually this is a lifelong process. Um, and I also wanted to, to make it clear that, you know, a lot of books that have um, f food and, and health connected are all about weight loss. And I'm not about that. I'm about putting your body in the best environment as possible. Um, and it starts with our brains. Um, so, so, yeah, that's why I, I, I started about it. And I'm fascinated with the concepts of um, neuroplasticity and, and brain inflammation and, and how certain diets can help mood and, and how we can gently push people toward um, that way of eating um, with, with colorful images, like you said, and, and quick recipes and simple kitchen herbs as well. Yeah, you know, I could, I could attest, and I'm sure you can too, there's there's few things as, as scary and unsettling as neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS. I mean, those are just scary to see patient decline, and it's and then it's obviously magnified a thousandfold when it's somebody in your family. Scary. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you write in your book, uh, you know, meat and fish should be treated like luxury items. Uh, can you explain that idea or concept a little further? Yeah, sure. So I think um, we have grown used to the availability of uh, animal products um, all over the place. Like every every store you go to, you know, we have processed convenience animal products, and and we don't really think about the process behind creating that product, that product, that food. These are prized, prized possessions. You look at ancestral. Uh, eaters, uh, you look at uh, tribal nations, we didn't have the ability to go down to a local store and pick up a piece of salmon. You know, th this is something that was a rarity and it's something that was super, super um, treasured. And so when I say luxury items, I mean the best quality you can find, um, the, uh, the the most sort of uh, at one with, with nature, so a wild caught salmon, for example, or um, uh, wild uh, wild um, uh, caught uh, deer and, and elk and, and all these different types of, of, of meats um, and having that as a as a rarity as well so something that you enjoy on occasion rather than something that you have to eat every single day and I feel that um, when you look at population studies of people who eat who consume meat more often than others you know they have less better health outcomes um, that isn't to say that everyone needs to go vegan or vegetarian or anything like that. I think you can still enjoy meat if that's what you choose to do. But making sure it's the best quality um, is, uh, is something that's very important. And, yes, it definitely costs more, but I believe it should cost more. Um, this is something that, you know, we shouldn't have uh, accessible access to. Um, and it's something that we need to be um, a lot more um, – conscious of as well that there is a sacrifice involved here and um with what we know about the current state of our environment um it, it's certainly uh, tipping the balance out of our favor at the moment yeah i've heard a lot of other people and uh i don't necessarily disagree uh you know that meat sh meat should be more of like the condiment not the main source of your your meal uh, yes and you know and I, i'm i'm one for balance i'm i've you know, eating a paleo style diet for nearly 12 years now, but that includes an enormous amount of vegetables and some fruit and occasionally some dairy and uh, other things as well. Um, 
but my plate is definitely filled with an enormous amount of vegetables every single day, <laughs> every single day, <laughs> colorful vegetables. Uh, yeah. th- there's two there's two terms in your book that I haven't seen that I think I understand, but I haven't seen, and I don't know if it's a European thing or it's something you're introducing or what, but meta inflammation and chrono or chrono nutrition. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, those are two of my favorite subjects right now. So, um, meta inflammation, also referred to as low grade inflammation, is okay. this concept okay. of um, inflammation, uh, generalized systemic inflammation, so inflammation all over the body, um, which is just kind of hanging around, not really doing much, but just there constantly in the background. And it presents a number of different symptoms, chronic fatigue, brain fog, um, pain, uh, cognitive issues, but also inflammation as a process is underlying a lot of what we see in uh, lifestyle-related disease. So uh, diabetes, um, obesity, um, cardiovascular problems. And inflammation, uh, before we go into meta-inflammation, I should say quite clearly that inflammation is perhaps one of the most important processes for life that we have. Uh, the reason why we have achieved uh, the, the amazing ability to, to develop into adults and survive common cold, survive bacteria, survive all the environmental stresses that we're constantly bombarded with is because we have fully functioning immune systems where inflammation is uh, one of the mechanisms by, by which we protect ourselves. But it is the imbalance of inflammation, the excess of inflammation that can cause problems, and one of those is meta-inflammation. So in, in, in its very macro state, you know, we have pain, we have swelling, we have redness, but in the in the microscopic um, element, that's that's what we refer to as meta-inflammation. Um, and I, I find uh, the common triggers for this are sedentary lifestyle, so not getting up from your desk or not exercising, poor sleep patterns, but also excess sugar, not enough fiber, not looking after and nurturing that gut microbiota, the population of microbes that live in and around our body, but largely concentrated in our gut. And when we all those things are out of balance, then we, we can measure inflammation in the lab, but also in serum blood markers as well. And this is something that, you know, what we do in, in clinical practice. Uh, and the second point, chrononutrition is um, uh, the uh, the ability to change uh, health outcomes by changing the timing of when you eat. So time restricted feeding, I think, is is a very popular term. Um, Session Pan has done some incredible work, uh, I believe, at the West Coast of America, um, uh, which is where you don't change anything actually. You don't change your your macronutrient compo- or composition. You don't change the calorie you just change that is a fascinating subject sometimes you know i I work in the nhs um, as a general practitioner and and emergency medicine and um we have very resilient uh resistant patients to change who who don't believe that they can eat healthy who who don't want to eat healthy and for those patients chronic nutrition is actually a very uh important tool Uh, sometimes i would say okay the next best step for you it's not to change. I won't change what you want to. If you, you you choose what you want to eat, but just just promise me this: just eat in a rough 11-hour window. So if you start eating at eight, you just finish eating at 7 p.m. and just see what happens. And there's a number of different things that will probably happen. They probably eat less overall because they're not going to be eating out of boredom in the evenings. But also, there may be something that we're changing in terms of the hormonal balance their impact on their sleep rhythms, their impact on inflammation levels, the ability uh, of, of them to give their gut a rest. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a few things I think in chronic nutrition that are interesting enough for me to put it as a principle, and it kind of underlies uh, one of the things that I think you can include into a healthy dietary pattern that protects you against illness. Yeah. I've become very clear over the last, last several months um, – with my patients, when they ask me these types of questions, the first thing I do or first thing I coach them with is restricting their time window of eating or time, like you said, time restricted eating to 12 hours. And I say, I, I believe just about everybody and anybody uh, can have an eating window of 12 hours and a non-eating window of 12 hours. I believe, maybe you do, maybe you don't, I believe that's possible for everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely think so. I think it's probably, you know, the next best step for a lot of people who are resistant to change and it's a very effective tool. And 
I like to eat in a in a 12 hour or actually a, probably a, more like a 10 hour window yeah, myself. Yeah. So I'm in New York at the moment and I had a great dinner yesterday with Chef David Boulay and uh, we're eating until like 10:30. So I, I you know I'm not rigid with the rules, um, but I certainly uh, uh, try to introduce it as a principle to guide me most of the time. Yeah, yeah, I I, I like you. I'm a t- I'm a 10 hour window eater for certain. And um mm. uh, and and the benefits that I've seen by just not like you said not changing what the person is eating but changing the timing of when they eat it has profound impact without a doubt. And if I like you, if I eat till ten o'clock in the evening, I use I won't have um something to eat until ten or eleven the next morning or even twelve o'clock. You know, just That's exactly that. what I'm doing at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh. Oh, but that sounds like a great meal. What a great chef. You're lucky, lucky man, my friend. Lucky man. Yeah, that was great. We, we did like a, a nice little talk and we, we hung out and, uh, he's just a, a magician with, with food, you know, 800 different types of oils and all different types of plants he gets, uh, imported from Japan. And yeah, just a, a very, very cool chef. Someone, um, uh, who makes my cooking look, uh, pretty elementary. <laughs> Well, let's let's talk about that. So let's talk then, um, because like I said, the pictures in the book are great and they're colorful. And you know, colorful foods are important. So why are um, colorful foods, vibrant foods, um, you know, so important? It's the only the only white food that I can think of that's good for you is cauliflower. <laughs> the rest of it yeah. is, is uh, oranges and, and and you know greens and reds and oh well, maybe I guess radishes some radishes are white but what uh talk yeah. about this the colorful foods why is that so important? Well, I think it's like the easiest way to guarantee that you're getting not only uh, nutrient dense like micronutrient dense uh, ingredients like your traditional essential vitamins and, and minerals but also phytonutrients and, and phytonutrients are the plant chemicals that we find exclusively in our, in our produce um, which confer benefits to the human host and, and other organisms so uh, you know these are things like resveratrol and indothricarbonyl and sulfurophane and all these fancy terms that we like to show studies around where in reality there are literally over 8,000 different phytochemicals and the only really impressive way to, to introduce these into your body isn't purely through supplemental forms. It's through eating as many different colors as possible because in your simple apple, your humble, humble apple, you have hundreds of these different types of compounds that are like perfectly wound in the right proportions to each other to be bioavailable and to be digestible by the human host. And so I, I find colors are just so, it's just an easy principle to put into people's headsets and mindsets when they're eating that will make maintain their uh, consumption of all these different chemicals that are immeasurably um, uh, successful for, from a health outcomes. And the other thing is, and, and you alluded to this with your description of the, the photos, is that it makes food visually more appealing. I, I like to think that, you know, we eat with our eyes, we eat, we eat with our taste buds, um, we also eat with our, our smells, um, our noses, but also our ears and the way food is described to us. You know, when, when you go to a restaurant and uh, the waitress or the maitre d' is describing what's on the menu, it just sounds incredible. Even if it doesn't, uh, like, come out exactly the way you uh, expected it, just that uh, is part of your eating process and it makes it so pleasurable. And so I, I'm so glad that you like the, the images. I, I remember being on this photo shoot um, for all... Uh, the seven days we were doing it and I was like messing around with where I put this particular piece of seaweed or this coriander or the herbs and I I cut it a certain way and you know I wanted it to be really like my kind of style Um, and yeah it's just like family friendly good accessible ingredients that you know isn't uh, out of the reach of of anyone in the country I hope. Yeah, and you mentioned you mentioned the microbiota too, and the and the more different colors you have will translate to the more different types of soluble and soluble fibers, which are extremely important for our microbiome and the diversity of microbiome. So there's a lot of benefits to having a lot of different colors for sure. Absolutely, absolutely, and you, you know we're learning more about the way in which these different um, phytochemicals 
interact with your gut microbes to create metabolites that might actually be having the impact. So resveratrol, for example, um, you know, it might not be the resveratrol, it might be the tens of different types of metabolites of resveratrol that are then taken to systemic circulation that are ha actually having the cardiovascular protective uh, um, impacts on, on your body. So th there's this huge science that we still have yet to discover, but it always comes down to those simple principles, ones that I put in the, in the final chapter. Plant-focused, different types of fiber, quality fats, color, eating in time, and eating whole. Um, and yeah, if we could get more people eating like that, you know, we'll be looking after a lot of people. Yeah, that's for sure. Now, is there, is there one or two or three of like, what's your favorite recipe? Let me ask it that way. What's your favorite recipe in the book? I would say uh, it's really hard to have a favorite. Uh, I'll be honest, <laughs> but I, I tell you some of the popular ones. So my uh, Thai style salmon burgers, uh, I think, uh, awesome like um that's blended um uh salmon with lemongrass and glangao and chili and uh, thai basil and you know tons of different herbs and spices in that um so uh, yeah and it's very very easy to make in batch as well um which is what you know i, I think uh, a lot of the people are working on the go like myself it's, it's quite hard to to um, maintain a healthy diet so batch cook is always good um, my Sri Lankan cashew curry, um, an unusual ingredient for a lot of people using cashews, but again, fantastic source of different types of uh, fibers um, and an interesting way in which to use uh, chickpeas and curry powders, and, and those have tons of uh, um, impacts. I mean, people like to talk about adaptogens um, like rhodiola and uh, a whole bunch of other ones, caffeine being the most popular adaptogen. But our kitchen herbs are just as impressive, and I think utilizing those um, is, is super important and very, very accessible as well. Um, and the other one I would say is um, uh, it's the aubergine walnut ragu. So it's a, a slow roast uh, um, tomatoes that I've added some balsamic vinegar to and garlic and a whole bunch of others. And I, I've also done them with aubergine. And aubergine is traditionally not something that people know how to use that much. Where you combine that with roasted walnuts and lentils, it creates this gorgeous, unctuous, meaty, even though it's a vegeta vegetarian dish, meaty dish. Um, and that was the favorite actually on the photo shoot. So, so the crew just went wild over that one. We had like a, a big meal midway through one of the days. And, um, yeah, that was, um, and it's it so easy to make as well. Well, I, you know, what, it, what is aubergine? Oh, sorry. Uh, you guys got an eggplant. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. Because I'm saying to myself, I, I have a pretty big garden, and I and I have like 12 different herbs, and and I, you know, I, and I'm like, what the heck is it all over there? All right. So, so an eggplant. All right. So, all right. So, need an American version because people will be very confused. <laughs> all right. All right. That's cool. That's cool. So, uh, um, you know, I can't, or in my partners, we can't get through an interview. <clears throat> without talking about sleep and the uh -huh. importance of sleep. Uh, how can diet improve your sleep patterns or vice versa? Or what are your thoughts or, and concepts on sleep? So the two things I would say with diet and sleep um, are not eating too late because that can inhibit uh, one of the hormones that induces um, sleep. Um, and it can shift um, the circadian rhythm out of whack. So it pushes um, back the time at which you're going to be coming uh, sleepy. Um, that's not to say you want to go to bed completely hungry, but you want to leave at least three or four hour gap, I find. It's, it's quite effective for a lot of people. And again, having the ability to rest your gut and, and those kind of stuff. Um, and then also what types of food you eat during the day can also impact your sleep as well. So if you're going to be having lots of refined carbohydrates, lots of high sugar foods, lots of high energy foods, and that's going to be having a detrimental impact on your sleep patterns. You're going to get sleepy during the day. You might even have a nap or a micro nap. And then suddenly, before you go to bed, you're, you're awake. And I, I find a lot of people have that pattern, myself included sometimes, depending on what I'm doing that day. Not often. Um, those are two things, I, uh, two main ways in which um, our diets can impact sleep. There are some, um, you know, other ways in which people like to talk about, so tryptophan rich foods, uh, things like pumpkin seeds, uh, things like uh, certain types of organ meats, 
Um, having those later in the day might induce sleepiness, but rather than trying to knock ourselves out with food, I, I'm more of a uh, um, an advocate for getting ourselves in a sleepy state by relaxing, put ourselves in a, in a good mindset. I practice a, a gratitude, I have a gratitude journal every day, and that, that puts me in a, a very positive mindset before going to sleep. And I think um, you know it's, it's quite a powerful but yet simple tool to use. Um, to improve um, something that is absolutely uh, the the real leveler of, of health outcomes and the quality of our sleep, and I, I'm a, I'm obsessed with sleep myself. I mean, I have um, one of those uh, um, rings um, to measure my HRV overnight and um, my my baseline heart rate, um, and I can tell when I've had a bad night's sleep. Um, and matching that, becoming a lot more intuitive about what I personally eat. Um, is uh, it's a real journey and it's a real process as well. Yeah, I, I put a high level of importance on my sleep and track it with an aura ring as well, just to uh, yeah. And uh, it's it's really really interesting. So, Doc, is there anything that we missed regarding the book that you'd like to discuss? Oh no, I mean like uh, you know the, the whole reason for uh, an MD talking about you know food and, and medicine is really because. I believe simple changes to what we eat and how we live can amplify our defenses uh, ever getting ill in the first place. And that really fundamentally is what eat to be illness is about. It's about lowering our risk and it's about enjoying our food and uh, not becoming restrictive or anxious about it. It's actually about, you know, the grander landscape. And, and if we as doctors can teach people to or, or create an environment which allows health to flourish independently of us. Um, that's really the future that we want to be we want to be heading for. You know, as as traditionally trained uh, trained medics, we um, we try a pathogenic uh, model of healthcare, which is where we try and identify the mechanisms of disease, and we try and symptom control with the pharmaceuticals. And we've done fantastic jobs of that great, great leaps in, in scientific research and discovery. And I, I don't doubt, I mean, I use that all these different advances every single day whenever I'm doing emergency medicine. But one thing we are lacking is salutogenesis. There's this, in, this uh, understanding of uh, the processes toward well-being. And when you look at those, it's things like community, sense of purpose, good diet, nourishing environment, supportive environment. Uh, and that's where we need to focus a lot of our attention because the, the diseases of uh, our modern times are, are ones where those uh, building blocks towards health creation are broken. Uh, Dr. Otto, I'm so happy you mentioned the word. And it, you may be one of the first people that have mentioned it, uh, uh, maybe a, several, I don't know, 300 plus podcast episodes of salutogenesis, basically the process of creating health. You want you want to give that definition of salutogenesis one more time, please? Absolutely, man. Yeah. So salutogenesis is essentially the antonym to pathogenesis. Salutogenesis being the creation of health and the processes toward uh, creation of health. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad you you picked up on it, man, because I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate this um, because. We have a, 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 a very naive and narrow focus on, okay, what's the symptom? Let me stop that. Or is actually, why don't we rewild people? Why don't we put people in their natural environment and allow their innate self-healing mechanisms to flourish? Um, and, and we can do that by food, yes, and, and nourishing that gut microbiota, yes, with different types of fibers and variety, but also with uh, giving people a sense of purpose, support, yeah, you know, I, I did this um, interview recently with a, a colleague of mine who's a nurse, and she she quoted Gandhi in, in a book that she she uh, wrote, uh, and and his and I'm going to bastardize this quote now, but his quote was really about the measure of a humanity is how we look after the most vulnerable in our society, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if we can put a focus on that, then the benefits that we reap from that process uh, will be shared with everyone, and and that's what. I think uh, a fundamental feature of salutogenesis is about. So um, I'm, gl I'm glad you picked that up, man, because that's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with concepts, and I think, you know, this is just one way in which we can um, push people towards a greater understanding of that. Awesome. So la last question I ask most people or every, every guest that I interview, what is your daily routine um, from waking to sleep? 
So, oh, that's a tough one. Cause, <laughs> so my, my daily routine is, um, it, it's very different depending on what I'm doing that day, but I'll give you some core cool features that I try to maintain regardless of whether I'm in accident, whether I'm in ER or whether I'm in clinic or whether I'm traveling. Um, I always start my day with a mantra. Um, and it's usually looking out the window and just uh, saying, you know, life is beautiful. The world is beautiful. I'm grateful for being here. Um, and it's very simple like that. Um, I've started writing an affirmation with my left non-dominant hand because A, it improves your synaptic connections when you're using your non-dominant hand. You have to concentrate. Uh, and B, writing the affirmation as well. It, it's a lot slower if you're using your non-dominant hand. So I, I, I find that really makes me concentrate on what I'm writing and what my affirmation is. Um, I meditate uh, the first thing in the morning now. So uh, 10 minutes before I get my drink or before I brush my teeth or anything, I just, I'd sit, uh, I, I get myself in a calm state and I meditate. Uh, and I have a time restricted feeding sort of um, thing. So I, similar to you, I eat in a, in a, in a window. I exercise uh, every, most mornings I would say, um, for at least 30 minutes. And that can be a mixture of HIIT or uh, yoga or um, flow or strength. Um, and I pra- and in the evenings, I practice um, uh, my gratitude. Um, I always try and end off the, the, the day with that. And peppered in between that, it's like tons of vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the, the writing an affirmation with your non-dominant hand. That's, that's pretty great. I will definitely institute that for sure. Try it, man. Try it. I'd, I'd be interested in, uh, in hearing what you think of it. 100%. So how can our audience get a hold of you? Sure, man. So uh, I'm at thedoctorskitchen.com. My socials are doctors underscore kitchen on Instagram and Twitter and all the other usual places. And the book is out on uh, in Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And you can you can pick up the American copy on my website um, as well. Cool. So yeah. Cool. Yep. And the link the link will be um, in the show notes for sure. Um, so you and it'll be in all our d- emails when the when the podcast comes out, which I'm pretty certain is going to be next monday so thanks again doc i appreciate it. i hope you enjoy the rest of your time in uh um the states thank you very much man i really appreciate it have a great day my pleasure my name is dr noah decor your co-host and you're listening to the beyond your wildest genes podcast if you like what you've heard today please share this with your friends and encourage them to subscribe on itunes you can scru- subscribe to our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com and as my oldest son, Hayden, says, be awesome and never unawesome. It's Dr. Noah, and I'm back. In this new format, we will briefly mention the product, book, and supplement of the month for each and every month at the beginning of the podcast, and then discuss them more thoroughly at the end of the podcast. We hope you love this new format. So, the book of the month for September 2019 is The Emotion Code, How to Release Your Trapped Emotions for Abundant Health, Love, and Happiness by Dr. Bradley Nelson. We highly recommend this book. It's on my Audible playlist currently. You can hear Dr. Mike interview Dr. Bradley on the August 19th podcast release. Simply stated, a great listen. The supplement of the month for September is BYWG's Nutrition's Joint Formula Plus. The 10% off code for the month of September is joint 4 SEP. That's capital J, lowercase O-I-N-T, number 4, capital S, lowercase E-P-T. This is a powerful blend of building blocks associated with joint and cartilage repair, like glucosamine and MSM. It also includes nutraceuticals like bromelain and grapeseed extract with anti-inflammatory processes that improve recovery, help manage arthritis pain, and can slow the degenerative process. Are you a weekend warrior? Hey, everybody. Are your children heading back to school and you finally have time to do something just for you? Do you feel that you're just one messy flux of hormones? Are you feeling overwhelmed and stressed by life right now? If you'd answered yes to one, more than one, or all of these, then the Getting to Goddess program is for you. We are thrilled to announce that we are releasing our Getting to Goddess program this Labor Day weekend and running through September 23rd at an incredible discounted price to help you take charge of your life and health, and it's just for women. The course is normally $297, but by using the code HEALTHYWOMAN at our checkout, 
you'll receive $200 off, making the price for the entire course only $97. In addition to the course, for those of you who purchase, we'll be hosting a live Q&A early October. Thanks for listening.